is awkward. Hello. <laughs> How are you doing? Today, I'd like to share with you a few observations that I've had uh, in the past few years living, breathing, and working in digital. And I'd like to start us off with a simple question. How many of you have heard the phrase, knowledge is power? Everybody, right? Yeah, good show of hands. Thanks for participating. <laughs> and uh, so what you might not know is that this phrase was coined by somebody. It was coined by Francis Bacon. There's, there's a slide that's supposed to come up. Uh, the, the phrase knowledge is power was coined by Francis Bacon. So Francis Bacon uh, is, a, is a scholar, a 16th century English scholar who was a philosopher, he was a scientist, and he was also a writer. And so he came up with the phrase uh, knowledge is power in a book that he published in 1597. So uh, back in 1597 and during Francis Bacon's lifetime, uh, the, the amount of documented knowledge that was available uh, was relatively scarce. I mean, the printing press, here we go, the printing press had been published, uh, had been invented maybe uh, a century beforehand, but a fair amount of the books that were available were still handwritten manuscripts. So the first question was easy. The second question that's a little harder is how many books do you think were published in 1597? Best guess. So if you're like me, you're probably wishing you had Wikipedia up on your phone right now. And that's exactly what I did when I started thinking about this was I just took a cruise on the web and the best estimate that I could find was about 10 million. 10 million books published annually uh, throughout the 16th century. Now that might seem like a lot, uh, but then when you compare it to how far we've progressed since, uh, this, this is what the chart looks like. You see a nice exponential growth curve that reminds you of Al Gore and the inconvenient truth. Like, look how far we've gone. Um, <laughs> So according to the best estimates that I can make uh, based on Globe and Mail, uh, I'm guessing that in 2010 there was the equivalent of maybe 125 billion books uh, that, were, that were created and documented uh, in 2010. I mean, that is just a staggering, staggering amount of knowledge that we're creating. And it's not just because we know a lot more than we did back in the 16th century. Uh, it's because it's being documented much more widely. It's being documented much more quickly and there's far more efficient tools at, at spreading this knowledge and, and discovering this knowledge. Now, I, I think the notion of uh, the free flow of information is not a new one, right? I mean, the, the term information superhighway has already been mentioned earlier today, and, and it, uh, it was coined back in the 90s, so there's nothing new about that. But I do feel like we've sort of reached a tipping point right now where there's such a wide breadth of knowledge and you can go so deep on really niche topics that, uh, that, that a new question starts to emerge, which is, well, what's next, right? What, what, what becomes really important once all information is readily available? So in Francis Bacon's time, knowledge was power, but now knowledge is just available on tap and anybody can get access to it. So then what is the new currency for power? And that's what I want to talk about today. So the first type of information that I want to cover uh, is any information that answers the question, how do I? So how do I do blank? Uh, this includes instructional videos, it includes how-to videos, online courses, what have you, but anything that helps you learn how to do something new. So uh, I spent a year traveling around the world in, in 2008, and I specifically focused on third world countries because I was young, you know, I wanted to do the whole backpacking thing, and I wanted to go where I knew it was going to be physically challenging. And uh, one of the toughest places that I went to was Burma or, or Myanmar. I mean, at the time, uh, Burma was under a very, very strict military dictatorship to the point where the, the head of the opposing political party uh, had been under house arrest for years. So this was something that I didn't want to take too lightly. I didn't want to get myself in too much trouble. So I actually spent four full days in Bangkok uh, doing my research, getting my visas lined up, and really digging on, on a bunch of traveler forums to figure out what sort of challenges I would find when I got there. And what I found was that the single most interesting part of traveling in Burma is money and, and the challenges associated with money. So because uh, Burma has been under so many economic sanctions for so long, you actually can't find a lot of form of payment that work there. 
So credit cards aren't accepted there. Uh, ATM cards, there aren't any ATMs that you can find uh, that can access the global network. Traveler's checks aren't accepted there. They only take cash. But the problem is, you can't even take any sort of cash. They only take US currency. So this is interesting. So I start digging deeper into it, and I find that there's actually been some rampant counterfeit schemes that have been run in the country. So people are really, really paranoid about the types of bills that you bring into the country. So you've got your US dollars. If they're any higher than a $20 denomination, people won't take it. If there's any wrinkles or folds in the bills, it won't be accepted. If there's any pen marks or even pencil marks on it, uh, it'll get turned down. And then I start really digging into the web and I find that there's actually a couple of serial numbers that are raised alarm bells. So if the serial number on your bill starts with the letter CB, uh, people aren't gonna take it. Some people might, but most will assume that it's counterfeit. So after reading this, I spent an afternoon at a bank in Bangkok and I literally had a huge stack of 20s here. And everybody in the bank was looking at me funny, but I was meticulously going through and inspecting them and like erasing any pencil marks that I found and making sure they were perfectly flat. Um, and I probably only used one bill out of every 40 that I went through. But I'm really glad I did that upfront work because it would have been pretty painful to be stuck in Burma, uh, having no currency that anybody would accept and no way of getting more money. So this is one example of some really, really niche information that's just like freely available out there. Fast forward a year, and I'm living in New York City now, and I'm starting to rediscover the joys of riding a bicycle. Uh, I'd never really grown up being that, that into bicycles, but it's a great way to get around the city. And it got to the point where I wanted to learn how to build a bicycle. So of course, I started doing my research, and through Bicycle Tutor and YouTube videos, I started understanding the difference between English threaded bottom brackets and Italian threaded bottom brackets, or gear inches and how that affects the railer lengths. I mean, really obscure, obscure stuff. Um, but the point that I really wanted to make is that there's such a wide variety of niche topics that you can dig into now. Um, just about anything, any type of obscure knowledge is available on TAP. M maybe not neurosurgery, but there's probably bits of neurosurgery that you can learn about on the web. So the second type of information that I wanted to talk about answers the question, how am I doing? So once you've started going down a path, what types of tools and how can you quickly get feedback on, on, on how you're progressing? So of course, uh, everybody here has used Yelp to find, to find restaurants, right, to eat at. But if you flip it around for a second and you think about, from the restaurant owner's perspective, what Yelp does for their business, now all of a sudden you have this free tool that tells you what dishes people like, what dishes people don't like, what they actually think about your customer service, and how do you compare to all the other restaurants uh, around the block from you, right? Uh, this didn't exist just a few years ago. If you're a contractor or you're a plumber, Angie's List provides the same service for you. What's the quality of service that you offer? Do people believe in the product that you're providing? And then if you're an employer of any sort, uh, Glassdoor is a safe place where employees can anon anonymously post uh, angry messages about how they hate the management and uh, how they hate the work environment and, and, and slavish hours. But it's an accurate reflection of what people actually think about your business, which is important. And, and these feedback tools are, are, are a relatively new phenomenon. But there's also much, much more uh, obscure ways of getting the feedback that you want. So uh, back in 2009, I had the crazy idea that I wanted to start this small side business importing Chinese medicines into the US. And, and, and it seemed crazy, but I was interested. And in retrospect, it doesn't seem half as crazy as growing mushrooms out of a coffee can. <laughs> but, um, but it's something I wanted to pursue. And, and so I used this tactic that I picked up from a, a book that Tim Ferriss wrote where I basically built a, a website, but the whole thing was just a shell. So I created a website, and it had a product page on it, and it had a photo there, and it had the name, and product description, and marketing copy. But instead of an add to cart button, I put a temporarily out of stock message with a little email field to give me your email, and, and we'll notify you when the product's back in stock. So the truth of the matter is I had no stock at all, right? I mean, <laughs> if you wanted to import Chinese medicine, you had to do it like 100,000 units at a time, and there was no way I was about to invest that quite yet. But I did want a way to capture uh, whether there was consumer interest. So once I had this site up and running, I took out a bunch of uh, AdWord ads and started finding uh, people who were searching for herbal remedies or Chinese remedies and directing them to my site. And then I could accurately measure when, how many people came to my site how long did they stay here? And then what percentage of those people were actually leaving their email address behind? Um, unfortunately, uh, the amount of interest that I got wasn't enough for me to go any further and justify a more investment. 
But the point is that this was something that I did really quickly, really cheaply, and instead of sitting around a bar with some buddies over beer speculating about, wow, I had this cool idea, uh, I actually went out and got real customer feedback about whether this was going to succeed or not. So I, I, I work at Huge, and, uh, and we're a digital agency out of New York, and we work with a lot of really high-profile brands and, and a lot of Fortune 100 companies. And when you look at our clients and, and what they're really asking of us, and you strip away the specifics of their business or you strip away the nuances of their industry, it, it really just comes down to this one question. And if you can't see it, it, they're basically asking, where should I invest in digital? And this is a very simple question. And a lot of the principles that I picked up uh, pushing Chinese medicines apply here. The way that huge uh, approaches projects is uh, we, we rapidly try to learn about your business as fast as we can. And then we start building ideas around what you could be doing. Uh, and we'll do rapid brainstorming. And then we'll pick the most promising idea, build a prototype around it, put it out there in the marketplace, and just see, uh, just see how customers react. Um, I don't think this is a particularly new notion for uh, a lot of the companies who are in startup mode. But for big, big, giant global corporations, this is a relatively new way of doing things. I mean, the old way of doing things was uh, you would assign a team of analysts. They would go away uh, in like a conference room for two or three months. They'd pull out their spreadsheets and build this complicated model in which they would predict and forecast what consumer reactions would be to a new product that you're launching. But in the same amount of time, with the same amount of effort now, we have these, we have these feedback tools that we can just push a prototype out there and have actual customer reactions and know with certainty uh, whether this product is going to succeed or not. And then, of course, that informs the next round of decision making. I also uh, talk to a fair number of people at either recruiting events or at conferences or at meetups. And, and usually it's people who are like business school students or, uh, or, or people who are trying to make some sort of career change. And they all want to know, how can I break into digital? And the unfortunate truth is uh, it's a lot easier to get a job in digital if you have some sort of tech background already. But uh, it, it's not all doom and gloom because uh, I don't really think that you need explicit work experience on the web in order to have the skills that you need to do the job. Um, these days, just about every aspect of our lives are touched in some form or fashion by the web, so it's really easy to pick up the skills that you need just by doing stuff on the side. So let's assume for an example that you, you volunteer at a, at a pet shelter. Uh, I don't think it's too far-fetched with the knowledge that's available now on the web that you can go and figure out how to run their website. And then once you started doing that, you'll get a sense for how do you get people to the site, how do you get people from the site to come into your pet shelter and actually adopt. Maybe you're starting to look at more sophisticated email tools that let you track uh, how many emails you have to spam somebody with before they come and adopt a puppy. Um, it, it sounds really trivial, you know, trying to get somebody to adopt a puppy, but uh, a lot of the underlying principles are directly applicable to what glo global corporations are doing at massive, massive scale. So I think uh, we're actually at a point now where we're well past uh, the era of the information superhighway. I mean, anything that you want to learn about, you can go out and find. If you need feedback about how you're doing, you can go out and get that as well. Uh, Francis Bacon uh, thought that knowledge was power back in his era, but in our, in our modern society now, um, just about anybody can learn anything, and you no longer need a formal education, you no longer need explicit work experience to be pursuing what you want to pursue. Uh, so, so in this kind of environment, I really do think that then uh, the new determinant of success and what will separate people who succeed or not are the people who are going to take action and are willing to act on the knowledge that's just out there. There's some people who see it and don't act, and there's some people who see it and do act. And that's really what's going to kind of shape uh, the next generation. So uh, whether you're an executive who's trying to figure out how you want to invest in digital, or whether uh, you're somebody who's looking to make a career change, I think the moral of the story is the same, is that the knowledge is out there. The tools are out there. Uh, you just need to make sure you don't look for too long before you go ahead and take the leap. So I, uh, I already talked about how I built up a bike. That was my first bike. And I'm actually in the process of building up a second bike now that's going to be much more like a city bike. Uh, you know, it's going to hold luggage. It's got a nice basket. I, I told my wife that you know, I was building up the second bike for her. Um, but the dirtiest truth is it's, it's actually just a second bike for me. Um, but I'm really excited about it because the first bike that I built 
uh, it came with pre-built wheels, because wheels are really hard to do. But then I came across this great uh, little guide on, on the art of wheel building. So for the second city bike that I'm building for my wife, um, it, it, I'm going to be building it up from scratch with the hubs and the spokes and the wheels, and I, I'm super excited about it. And I don't know what sort of personal projects or personal goals you have for yourselves. You know, maybe there's some hobbies you want to pursue. Maybe there's a business venture that you've been contemplating. Maybe you're looking for a career change. Um, but I think the message is pretty clear that there's really nothing that's holding you back anymore. Certainly not compared to, say, the 16th century. Um, there's no longer the lack of knowledge uh, that you can go to as an excuse. So if, if you've been considering uh, doing something, regardless of what you might be considering, um, I hope you'll stop considering and just go out and do it. Thanks a lot.